When you think of Victorian serial killers, you're almost inevitably drawn towards Jack the Ripper. But Jack, if he even existed, was not the first serial killer of the Victorian age. He wasn't even the most prolific. For that, that requires a woman's touch. And in this episode, it's this woman, Mary Ann Cotton. On 24th of March 1873, the West Auckland poisoner, Mary Ann Cotton, was hanged at Durham Jail. In her 13-year killing career, she had seen off 11 of her children, three of her husbands, one of her lovers, and even her own mother. Born Mary Ann Robson, ironically on Halloween 1832, Mary Ann had an unpleasant, not exactly atypical, Victorian childhood. She was described in a later interview with the newspaper by her Sunday school teacher as a, quote, most exemplary and regular attender a girl of innocent disposition and average intelligence, distinguished for a particularly clean and tidy appearance. But in 1842, Marianne's father suffered a mining accident and died falling 150 feet to his death in a Durham colliery. And that meant that like many children of her age, with the main breadwinner in the family gone, Marianne had to cease her education and become part of the productive labour force, which she did by going to domestic service until the age of 16, when she left to train as a nurse. Now it's difficult to pin down who was Mary Ann's first victim, but the smart money is on husband number one, William Mowbray. William Mowbray was a labourer and later a stoker aboard merchant ships. Now following the deaths of a number of their children, from early childhood diseases and the unfortunate accidents that befell Mary Ann's own father, William Mowbray very sensibly took out life insurance on himself and also onto the children as well. Took this out with the prudential. A sensible move considering the number of workplace accidents that can occur in the Merchant Navy. When the almost inevitable accident occurred and William fell down an open hatch aboard a merchant ship, the worst of all possible outcomes happened to the family. William survived and was unfit for work. Over the course of the next few months, his health would deteriorate until eventually he died of gastric fever. And as a result of the insurance policy that he had taken out on his own life, Mary Ann collected her first insurance policy of £35, equivalent to six months of William's wages to enable the family to live. It was the first of many £35 funeral pay payments she would claim. She wasn't a widow for long, and whilst working at Sunderland Infirmary as a nurse, she met husband number two, George Ward, who was a patient of the hospital recovering from typhus. They married in August of that year after George was discharged from the hospital. This is not seven months since the funeral of William Mowbray. But George remained a sick man. He was unable to get regular long-term work and as such the family had to live on poor money and parish relief. George died in October of 1865, officially of the after effects of typhus. Mary Ann was a widow for the second time in the same year, but it wasn't a dead loss for her. She had another £35 she could collect from the Prudential and she did so. Husband number three looked to be a much better catch well-to-do shipwright James Robinson, who had hired Mary Ann as a live-in nurse to look after his sick daughter, who died shortly afterwards. Although it's worth pointing out that we don't suspect Mary Ann of actually killing that child. Now, in his grief, he found in Mary Ann all the solace and comfort that he needed, and it looked like another marriage was on the cards. A good one this time, but there was something standing in the way. Or more importantly, there was something lying in the way in a sick bed back in her home village. Mary Ann had to return home to nurse her sick mother. Mary Ann returned home to nurse her mother through a particularly strong bout of hepatitis. And needless to say, after quite a strong recovery, Margaret Robson died nine days later of gastric fever. Note gastric fever, not hepatitis. Marianne returned to the Robinson household, taking with her her remaining daughter. But the gastric fever soon followed, taking two of James Robinson's existing children 
as well as Mary Ann's own daughter, Isabella, in the process. As more grief dominated that household, the more solace Mary Ann could provide, the closer the two of them became. And they married in August 1867. Things actually started to look quite good at that point, quite settled. But then there was never a good situation that Mary Ann couldn't ruin. Mary Ann's constant pestering about life insurance really got James Robinson's suspicions up. And he had a look into his own accounts and the affairs of his new wife. And he found to his horror that she had run up debts of £60 and stolen £50 from him personally. That totaled up to £110, or the equivalent in today's money, about £13,000. Quite a hefty lot of debts and thefts to rack up for a newlywed. On top of that, to add insult to injury, he discovered that she had pawned his first wife's wedding ring, as well as a whole range of sentimental objects. Well enough was enough, and he threw her out onto the street. Might just have saved his life. Now that she was homeless and penniless, she moved back to her home community and into the care and assistance of her childhood friend, Margaret Cotton, who was in the process herself of caring for her recently widowed and incredibly depressed brother, Frederick. Now to Mary Ann, old habits die hard and she, understandably, went on to provide all the comfort that the depressed Fred Cotton needed in this delicate state. A state that got even more delicate following the death of his sister Margaret at the predictable cause of gastric illness. Mary Ann and Fred Cotton were married on the 17th of September 1870 in Newcastle upon Tyne, even though she was still legally married to James Robinson. And their first child was born later that year, joining Charles Cotton, who was Fred Cotton's son, from his first marriage. But like so many episodes in Mary Ann's life, this serenity was not to last. She'd rekindled an old affair with old miner Joseph Natras. Fred Cotton had to go. Fred Cotton died in December of what was fast becoming the usual course. And with Fred out of the way, and the insurance in the bank, she took in Joseph Natras as a lodger. Now personally, I would call into question whether or not to hook up with a woman who is widowed on average once every two years with the same course. But Natras had something going in his favour. He hadn't married her and he wasn't going to marry her. But he had changed his will to make her the sole beneficiary. And when Marianne started on yet another affair with yet another employer, a man called John Quick Manning, which resulted in yet another pregnancy, then yet another marriage looked to be on the cards. This sealed Joe Natras's fate with a loving cup of tea. But it didn't all go according to plan. Quick Manon soon tired of sleeping with his housemaid. And before long, Mary Ann was once again without a home and without a job. But she could still live on the proceeds of Joe Natras's death. So not all bad then. This is where the downfall of Mary Ann Cotton really takes hold. She'd moved back to her own home community. People knew her. She was once again claiming poverty, living on poor relief. Now, parish official Thomas Riley came to offer her work, nursing a woman back to health through smallpox, a live-in nurse. However, Mary had to decline because she couldn't take surviving son Charles Cotton with her because of the nature of the contagion. She did ask Thomas Riley to take him into the workhouse, but while Riley refused, because the workhouse rules stated that unless he was an orphan, he wasn't going to be admitted without a parent. In response to this, Mary Ann gave him a chilling reply, stating, I'll not be troubled with him long. He'll go soon like all the rest of the Cottons. And sure enough, five days later, Charles Cotton died. Well, you guessed it, a gastric illness. With this, Riley's suspicions were just too much and he begged the town doctor to delay issuing a death certificate until a full autopsy and examination had been performed. Meanwhile, Mary Ann could not claim the money that she'd insured Carl Charles Cotton for. 
However, the Doctor was quite prepared to go with natural causes. And it was really the fact that Thomas Riley begged that stayed his hand. And he did say that it was one more test that he could perform, although he was less likely or less confident of its result. And that was the Reich test. And the Reich test detects the presence of arsenic, as well as a few other base metal poisons, within a system. And the Reich test proved positive. Marianne was arrested at her home on 13 Front Street, West Auckland. And the bodies of Joseph Natras, Fred Cotton and Fred Cotton's other two children were exhumed and tested and found to have died from arsenic poisoning. The trial was a swift affair. It took the jury mere 90 minutes to convict her and the judge did not hesitate in passing the death sentence. During her time in Durham Jail, she wrote many letters, some of which are on display at the Beamish Museum. One of her letters was to husband number three, James Robinson. She included the phrase, if you had a speck of human decency, you would let me see the three children. Rich words from a child serial killer, don't you think? So how could she have got away with it for so long? Well, to see, let's have a look at some of the common causes of deaths at the time and their symptoms. Seeing any similarities here? Simply put, deaths in this manner from easily communicable diseases just don't arouse the same suspicion that they do today. Secondly, with the death of each husband, Mary Ann just moved on to another community. She would move from West Auckland to Seaham to Sunderland to Newcastle, back to West Auckland. A widowed woman needing an income travels to where the work is and can start a clean slate every time. Ask yourself, how well do you know your neighbour's background? Have you ever inquired? No, neither have I. Despite her expectations of royal clemency, none came. Mary Ann Cotton was hanged at the exercise yard of Durham Jail on the 24th of March, 1873. Mary Ann's crimes shone a light into the abuse of burial club money and life insurance schemes. And if you've ever wondered why you can't insure the lives of your own children, well, you have one woman to blame for that, Mary Ann Cotton. Mary Ann was survived by just two of her children. The first, George Robinson, who remained in the custody of James Robinson. And the second, Margaret Quick Manning, the illegitimate offspring of her affair with John Quick Manning. Ironically, these are the two children that she never really gave any long-term care to. And that probably saved their lives. Well, thanks for listening. And mind who you take tea with. Good night.